everyone, it's Doris, Kiwi Scrapper from New Zealand and I'm back here to today to share with you part two of this commemorative round album. Um, and in part one I showed you the box that this album goes into and gave you a little bit of background about each of these people. So you remember this is um, Alex. I didn't show you this page actually, so I'm just going to zip over this page, but I did show it to you. Down here we have, I've got some glass fringing beads in, in clear and gold. We've got pointed lace, we've got beautiful vintage doily that's very thick. Um, this lace here that goes all the way around in the circle is um, beautiful lace from a 1960s baby bassinet cover. You know, the big fancy drapes they used to put over them. Um, handmade flower by me and this is a handmade flower in here in the, um, a very, it's avocado dyed lace and this is another handmade flower by me um, over here we have uh, this beautiful ribbon organza and board, bordered with satin it's cream, ivory, beautiful colour this is um, a vintage earring and there's a satin covered bridal button up here, there's, there's a little doily up here, um, as I say this is a great big doily sitting on here, there's pearls all the way around here, they come right down to here, you can see them if you pull right back. Uh, this is a lovely peach coloured trim, um, rose trim, beautiful um, pearl trim around here which I got from one of the Etsy shops. So. That's that cover. Um, and I didn't I don't think I mentioned that these this has been done by two enormous rings. I mean I could get I could wear these as bangles. They're rings but just the normal type of ring um, ring binder things that you put through. And on this side, I'm not sure whether I showed you last time, there's just heaps and heaps of beautiful laces, there's tassels. Yeah, so I've tied those together but I had to use that because this is a very thick album so um, I hope this is going to show clearly because it's it's the morning anyway um, so I'm going to catch up with what we were before we we looked at Tatiana uh, sorry I beg your pardon Olga the oldest child of the Tsar of Russia Nicholas and his wife Alexandra uh, we looked at Tatiana the second daughter on her page. Oops, today I did. Oops, it's caught on one of those diamante <laughs> stones. Um, last, I finished off yesterday by talking about the angelic daughter, Maria, on her lovely page and the little angel I've put down here because she was called the angel of Russia. Now we're going to go on to the fourth daughter who is very well known. Now the reason this daughter is so well known, the youngest daughter, is simply because there were all kind of rumours flying around the world when this imperial family of Russia, after 15 months of captivity, just totally disappeared. Um, the Bolsheviks um, left the area that they were in, where this family was, and by the time the white Russians came along, um, the family had gone and nobody knew what had happened to them. They had just disappeared off the face of the earth. And there were rumours as, as the time progressed um, because nobody wanted to think the worst. So there were rumours that um, Anastasia had turned up um, in, I think it was France, somewhere in Europe, um, that one of the other girls, I think it was Maria, had and, and Maria and Anastasia together had become nuns. There were lots of rumours going around because nobody wanted to believe the worst. So this is Anastasia and here she is there. And she was the youngest daughter of the Tsar and his wife Alexandra. And um, Anastasia was born in 1901 
Um, and she was known by family and friends and household servants as, um, well, as Anastasia, but also as Melanchia, which meant little one, because she was the youngest child in the family at that time. Um, she was also known um, as a Russian word which I cannot pronounce, which meant imp, because she was a very naughty little girl. <laughs> yes, maybe that's why she's so popular. Um, she grew into a vivacious, energetic child with blue eyes and strawberry blonde hair. Um, she was the shortest of her three sisters, or the four girls. Um, and someone once said of her as when she was a toddler that she had the greatest personal charm of any child that they had ever seen. Um, she's often described as gifted and bright, but she was never interested in the restrictions of the schoolroom, um, according to her tutors. And ladies-in-waiting described her as lively, mischievous and a gifted actress. Her sharp, witty remarks sometimes hit very sensitive spots. Um, now, Anastasia's daring occasionally exceeded the limits of acceptable behaviour for a member of the royal family, and she was said to undoubtedly hold the record for punishable deeds in her family, for in naughtiness she was a true genius. <laughs> um, she would trip up servants, play pranks on her tutors and climb trees, refusing to come down from the tree unless her father appeared and ordered her to do so. <laughs> So she was, uh, yeah, she was a, a very lively little girl, and her g very gentle, loving sister Marie, um, who was the next child and the next little girl up, was constantly apologising on her behalf, um, you know, for for pranks and naughty things that Anastasia would do. Um, so Maria would, would run in and apologise profusely to the person and you know, but she couldn't stop her sister from being so naughty. Um, Anastasia was also known as the clown of the family um, because she would put on plays and she would you know, fall about and you often see photographs of, um, of Anastasia either on her own or in a family group where she's pulling faces, really. <laughs> You know, she's or, or she's looking incredibly bored, not wanting to stand there. Um, but yes, quite often, you know, you'll see photographs of her where she is being cheeky and pulling faces. Quite amazing, really. So that is Anastasia, and she's even had a movie made by her about her, or had a, had a few movies made about her. Um, okay, now just going to go on to this page here. And this page shows a photograph of the entire royal family. Now, you'll see the little boy here. This is Alexei, or Alexei. He was actually born um, last of the family, last child they had. And, of course, it was the very long-awaited boy. Um, so, obviously, they were absolutely delighted to have this little boy. And this little boy was like absolutely doted on by his entire family, um, by everybody, really. Um, unfortunately, he was born with haemophilia, which mean, meant that his life was in constant danger. Um, he was in constant danger of hemorrhaging internally and his blood couldn't clot because of the haemophilia condition. And, um, you know, his, his whole family lived in terror that he was going to bleed to death one day. He only had to have, you know, a small accident. It would cause bleeding and bruising and the bleeding wouldn't stop internally. Um, and even external bleeding was very hard to stop. So, of course, the family absolutely doted on this child and took enormous care of him. But because of this condition, which his mother, Alexandra, felt very guilty and of because she had been a carrier um, via her grandmother, Queen Victoria, um, females carry, can carry haemophilia, but they don't suffer from it, but they, they can pass it on to their male children. And um, that was sadly the case. So she felt very guilty and it, it really destroyed her health. She was so frantically worried about this child um, and so adored him that 
she was terrified of losing him every day, every single day. She was petrified that she was going to lose her son because he was going to die. So you can understand, you know, as mothers ourselves, how, how we would feel in that situation. But anyway, this is a lovely picture. This photograph was taken just a year, or maybe less than a year, um, before everything turned dreadful for this beautiful family. Um, there was a lot of political unrest in Russia at that time. As I said, Tsar Nicholas's grandfather had been um, assassinated when he was um, a child or in his early teens, I'm not sure which. Um, there was a lot of political unrest. And what happened to this family was um, the Tsar was forced to abdicate his throne. And he did so under pressure. He, he did abdicate. But it was on the condition that his family would be kept safe and, um, and that they would be allowed to, to go into exile somewhere and live like a normal family, you know, albeit a, a wealthy family, obviously a royal family, but to live outside of Russia. And, um, but they were taken into captivity in April 1917. And from then on, um, their lives were never very carefree. So they spent some time in, in ca in ha under house arrest in their, um, one of their palaces, but out of Moscow, um, one of the country palaces that they had. And um, it did have a lot... It, it did um, affect the family very much because obviously even though they were still living um, in relatively good conditions, they were under house arrest, there were guards everywhere they went with guns in their hands, um, they, they weren't free to leave the property, so they were under constant threat of, you know, living with the constant threat of um, perhaps being killed, being moved somewhere, you know, they didn't know what was going to happen from one day's end to the next. Um, now for Olga, who is here, um, when, when she became a prisoner of the Bolsheviks with her family, she became deeply depressed as time wore on and they weren't freed from captivity. Um, so she became deeply depressed. She lost a great deal of weight during her final months of imprisonment in Siberia because the family was moved from where they were to a much harsher um, regime of captivity in Siberia. And that happened in... Um, I think it was like April, a year later, in April 1918. So she lost a lot of weight. And a guard who was writing memoirs years later recalled that she was thin, pale and looked very sick. But she still managed to take care of... Um, she took turns with her sisters to take care of um, her, baby, her baby brother Alexei, or Alexei um, and her frail mother who was in a wheelchair by that time. She was ha giving birth to five children um, within a very short space of just a few years, plus um, her constant worry about her son just um, ruined her health, you know, totally destroyed her health. And physically, she was quite a frail lady. Um, now... Tatiana, you would think, you know, would come through this whole ordeal, you know, being a natural-born leader, you know, but she didn't come through this ordeal. She unscathed um, during this time. Um, it was recorded that Tatiana became razor-thin and seemed more inscrutable than ever, and that was written by her English tutor in his memoirs because at, that, at the early stage, for the first year, they still had some family staff, they still had their tutors, um, so life, even though they were prisoners and under house arrest, life kind of like, um, you know, continued as it, as it had been, but they were just prisoners. It wasn't until they were moved to Siberia in April 1918. Um, well, their, their parents and one of the sisters, Maria, was, was moved first. Alexei had had a fall and was very sick um, and couldn't go with them so the other sisters stayed behind. So that, that period for uh, I think six weeks they were separated before everybody could travel to join the, fa the rest of the family in Siberia. Um, Maria, and what happened to her during this period of captivity? 
Well, Maria, because she was such a friendly girl, she just befriended all of the guards. And she found out about their families, their wives and their children and she talked to them about them and she, they were very fond of her. Um, and during this period of captivity, she grew from a child to a young woman. And um, her mother, Alexandra, depended on her a lot because she was a sensible girl, dependable, she did what she was told. Um, and one of the guards recorded in his memoirs years later that Maria was a girl who loved to have fun. Another of the guards recalled Maria's buxom beauty with appreciation and said that she did not assume an air of grandeur, that she was just a very plain, simple girl. Another guard, a 21-year-old, declared that he intended to marry one of the grand duchesses and if her parents said no, he would rescue her from imprisonment himself and he was referring to Maria. So Maria was very, very popular um, with her guards, with the guards that you know, stood guard over them. Um, and Maria celebrated her 19th birthday on June the 26th, 1918, and one of the guards smuggled in a birthday cake that his mother had baked for her. Um, this may have been the young guard that declared he wanted to marry her and was going to rescue her. Um, but the, the misdemeanour was discovered, sadly, and the guard was dismissed from his position, and after that, new and much harsher rules were, were introduced, um, including that there was to be absolutely no friendly interaction with the guards at all. So the family were not even allowed to talk to the guards. Okay, so Anastasia. Well, you know, let's think of Anastasia, this bright, bubbly clown of a girl, always joking, always teasing people, um, always laughing. Well... The stress and uncertainty of captivity during 1917 and the first half of 1918 affected Anastasia just as much as it affected any of the family. And remember, she was the youngest daughter. At that stage, she was still 16. And it affected her so much that she wrote to a friend, Goodbye, do not forget us. But even in captivity, Anastasia found ways to enjoy herself. She and other members of the household performed plays for the enjoyment of their parents and others in, and others in, the, sp in the spring of 1918. And Anastasia's performances were said to make everyone howl with laughter, according to her English tutor in his memoirs. Um, in, one of, in one of the guards' memoirs later, um, in the house in Siberia, which was called, I think it's pronounced, Impatif, Impatif House, um, he remembered Anastasia as a very friendly girl and full of fun. Another guard said Anastasia was a very charming devil who was mischievous and very rarely tired. She was lively and was fond of performing comic mimes with the dogs and as though she was performing in a circus. Um, in the summer of 1918, the, d the deprivations of captivity at Ipatif House in Siberia negatively affected the entire family as window panes were painted over and windows kept locked and shuttered. Anastasia managed to get a window open on one occasion and desperate to have a glimpse of the outside world, she stuck out her head and she was fired on by one of the new guards and the bullet narrowly missed her and she never tried that again. Um, so I'm going to now bring you over the, oh, I'm just going to talk about this page first here we've got the word love because this was a loving close family I've got a beautiful um, neck, not neck, this earring here which has got a, a gold rose and it's beautiful gems pearls because the mother, Alexandra, loved, loved, loved pearls. Just loved them. Better than diamonds, she just loved pearls. And all her daughters wore, wore pearl necklaces as they grew up. Um, this is a handmade flower by me. There's a little bit of a doily here. There's doilies here. There's a um, beautiful piece here of um, an applique, wedding bridal applique. Gorgeous pleated trim all, um, all the way around here. Uh, you can't see a lot of it. Let's have a look. No, you can't see much of it because it's... There it is. I'm not sure whether you can see that down there. It's a lovely trim. 
goes right back to here for laces and things and ribbons. Um, underneath that there's tassels and we've got um, beads up here, we've got doilies, two or three doilies on here. Lots of interest. So that is the entire family there. And as I say, that was taken shortly before, an official photo taken shortly before their captivity kicked in. Now this last page shows a very different, it's a very different kind of photograph altogether. Previously you've seen the girls all dressed up beautifully in white dresses and this is uh, a, a bunch of very unhappy looking girls, very thin, they're wearing, they're wearing identical clothes still, so these would have been their clothes. Um, but yes, very plain clothes. They're sitting on the floor. They're sitting on the ground, actually, if you see the whole photograph. There's mud on their boots. And in the background, their father, the Tsar, is digging. That's what their life's turned out like. And this is um, Anastasia in the middle. This is Tatiana. This is Olga. And this is Maria over here. And I do have another photograph with their brother, Alexei. Now, I haven't put Alexei in, or Alexei in this album on a separate page purely because, being a little boy, he would have had to have quite a masculine page. And I really didn't um, you know, know how to do that or want to do that in this album. So, yeah. And there's the last page, which has got Nicholas on it. Um, and I've kept that, although it's still very pretty, um, with this gorgeous lace around it, this pleated pleated trim. I've kept it as plain as possible. You know, he was a man who was surrounded by beauty, by jewels. So I you know, he didn't need it plain like that, but you know, I've kept it like that. So okay. I'm going to go back to the beginning now over here. Now we had remember the story um I was reading to you at the beginning of part one and how I ended it. And um, I'm just trying to find... Oh, here it is. Yeah. Just trying to read that ending again. And as I say, this is taken off the records of the people involved at that time, but they weren't made public knowledge until after the 1990s. Um, OK, so how I ended it. They're in the basement cellar. They've been told to go down. It's 3am in the morning, freezing cold, um, they've been told they're going to be moved uh, yet again um, to, for their own safety because the white Russians are coming and they're going to be firing upon the Bolsheviks who are holding them captivity in order to free them, to free the royal family or to rescue them. So they're, being, you know, they're told that for their own safety they're going to be moved somewhere far more safer um, and then they're left. They're left on their own for half an hour because, you know, they're told that the final arrangements for their journey are going to be made. Um, in actual fact, what was happening during that period of time, that half hour, unknown to the family, was that um, the guards, who were brand new guards, brought in from, um, I think some, some people say Hungar Hungary, some people say Latvia, um, yeah, diff but not Russian because the Russians would not take part in what was going to happen. They refused. Um, so they were out getting drunk. The guards were sitting out there getting drunk to fortify their courage. So suddenly, you know, after half an hour of standing there waiting for nothing for something to happen, the doors swing open. Um, and this, remember, this is 3 a.m. or just after 3 a.m. It's probably about 3:30 now, or around th between 3 a.m. and 3:30. And in walks the head guy, head of the Bolshevik guards, and curtly informs them that they're going to be executed. And all the Tsar has time to do is, go, is he says, what? What? And turns around to his family. So this is the family. This is the um, this is the inside of my lid. We've got handmade flower here. We've got other little flower, little gem here. Um, I've put frilled laces. The tassels are actually on the outside of the box. And this is the family when they're a little bit younger. This is Tatiana. This is Anastasia. 
This is the little boy Alexei. This is Maria. And this is Olga. And I'm going to leave that beautiful photograph for you to look at. Um, so what happened, you know, everybody stared in amazement. They didn't have more than a few seconds, not even to say goodbye. The girls apparently hugged each other from the records shown from the chief executioner. And in a hail of bullets, um, they were shot at. Their, um, their parents were killed and some of the um, some of the house staff had, that had remained with them very loyally were killed outright. Um, but the smoke was so thick that they, they couldn't even see anybody anymore so the guards left the room, closed the door, locked it up and just left them there. And there was the four young grand duchesses and Alexei who, who was still alive at that point but had been wounded and Maria had been shot in the leg at that time as well. Um, just left there with the bodies of their parents. Now, can you imagine the terror of these, of these children? And there was one of the house, uh, two of the staff were still alive. One of them was the doctor and one of them was, um, was Alexandra's maid and confidant for many, many years. And um, they, were, they were all still there, just standing in this horror. Well, I won't go into gruesome details, but... Um, it took several minutes for the air to clear and for the, the men to return um, and only two returned. One was the chief executioner, one was the, um, one of the other guards who got himself so drunk he could hardly stand upright and they took to these children with, with bayonets and, um, and, and did some shooting as well. Um, Maria was the this little girl here. Anastasia and Maria were the last two to be killed, and Maria actually was still alive when they were loading the bodies, dumping them into a truck outside for disposal, and um, and then she was um, she was killed. So you know, for years and years and years, um, as a child and all through my life, I really grieved for this family. I mean, you know, there's such atrocities in the world and we know about them and they're, and they're going on right now. But it just seems so hideous that this beautiful family who were born into royalty should have died in this dirty cellar in such a manner. And um, nobody ever knew, you know, the white Russians, the Bolsheviks dumped their bodies, disposed of them, mutilated them so they couldn't be recognised, separated bodies... Um, so that there would only be nine in the grave instead of eleven if it was discovered, and people wouldn't think it was it was that you know it was their family, it was that family because there weren't eleven members there. Um, did all kinds of things, and then they left, and then the White Russians came in a few days later, and they found all the family's stuff, all the family's things, but they couldn't find the family. Now they did find articles of clothing with blood on it, and the family pet, the little Pomeranian, they found his body down a, um, a uh, shallow mine shaft. And so that they knew the family had been killed. But nobody w wanted to believe that. Nobody wanted to believe that this entire family was just brutally murdered. And it wasn't until 1991 that a mass grave was found in the area of um, a Pahed, what's the house? A Patiath house, um, a few kilometres away, and because people had been searching covertly underground, you know, not, not wanting anybody to know. And um, yeah, a mass grave was found, but it was kept hidden because communism was still um, in control of the country in Russia, and they knew that if it was disclosed, that the communists would cover it up because this was a great shame to them. So when communism fell um, a few years later, obviously experts were brought in and DNA testing and various other things um, proved that this was the family. And But two children were missing. Alexei was missing and either Anastasia or Maria. And it was another few years in 2007 before they found the grave with those two bodies in it. Uh, and that was 70 metres away from the mass grave. Um, and there wasn't a lot left of it anyway because they tried to cremate the bodies, etc. 
Um, so DNA testing on the bones did prove that indeed this was the, the next in line to be Tsar of Russia. He was 13. Now at the time of the... And, and it was either Maria, his sister, or his sister Anastasia. They weren't sure which because of the condition of the bones. At the time of their, their brutal murder, Olga was 22 years old. The beautiful Tatiana had just turned 21 years old four weeks before the de her death. The angelic Maria had just turned 19 22 days before her death. And the mischievous little Anastasia um, had just turned 17 years old three weeks before her death and this very lovely little boy, Alexei, was just 13 years old. Alexandra herself, their mother, was 48 years old at the time of that murder, and their father, the Tsar Nicholas II, was um, 52 years old. So that is my commemorative album and the box. And in, this, in the bottom of this box, I've put this lovely paper, which is quite imperial, and I've put this um, beautiful family photo that was taken, obviously, when the children were quite young and the baby is little Alexei. So that's that beautiful family. Now, I've made a playlist, and on this playlist there are a number of videos um, that are showing the family um, in photographs and actual, amazingly... Um, lots of um, films, just short films showing the children playing together, showing the the children, the, the daughters when they were young ladies, uh, teenagers dancing. Um, beautiful family family films that have been released by the Romanov family um, and the Russian government. So in 2007, I think. Uh, no, in 1998, the people, the remains in the mass grave that was that was found in 1991, were in um, the royal family plus their loyal um, staff that died with them were interred in a church, a beautiful service and um, an official service in um, Petersburg, the, the one of the chapels that they, the churches they used to attend themselves. Um, I believe that little Alexei and either Maria or Anastasia, whichever sister it is that was with him uh, in that second grave, um, I believe that they still have not been united with the family in the family vault. And I don't know what the reasons are behind that. Um, but they were canonised, the entire family was canonised by the church as um, passion bearers in that they died for their faith, because communism killed them, destroyed that family. So, um, you know, if you're at all interested, um, do go over, have a look at the photographs of this family when it was, um, you know, and, and the films. The films are beautiful. Um, when they're ch little children, when they're teenagers, just beautiful. Showing them in their imperial um, regalia as a family. And that's really as, you know, we do need to remember what happened to them and the brutality of man towards man. But we also need to remember them as a beautiful family. So I'm going to say goodbye for now and I thank you for, for bearing with me for this, with, um, for this length of these part one and part two and I'm going to say goodbye. Bye for now.